Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a show that aims to provide hope, an avenue for healing, and one that will hopefully help you understand and then live the great mercy of God. With me today, I have a husband and wife, fascinating couple team here. Uh, we're going to share their story on Joe's miraculous recovery from end-stage uh, alcoholic liver disease and his associated um, mental psychosis. Uh, won't get into the medical terminology, but uh, it was pretty bad. Um, he and his wife have two children. He's a relative of uh, Father Michael McGivney. You probably recognize the name as uh, Blessed McGivney, of the founder of the Knights of Columbus, uh, who was beatified in October 2020. Uh, Joe has a book entitled You're a Miracle. Uh, my Story of Alcoholism, Miraculous Healing, and God's Infinite Power and Love, and it's available at sophiainstitute.com and Amazon. It's a very good read, uh, enjoyable read, and uh, we're just going to get into his whole story here, but both of you, welcome to Mercy Unbound. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us, Brian. We really appreciate the opportunity. Joe Nicole. Uh, Joe, first of all, let's start with you. Tell us about your childhood and uh, a little bit about uh, when you were introduced to alcohol. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, born on the south side of Chicago in a uh, very predominantly Irish Catholic neighborhood. Um, so typical cradle Catholic. I think I was baptized before I was 10 days old. Um, you know, ultimately made my first communion and then confirmation. I think I was in fifth or sixth grade when I was confirmed. Um, not long before my my love affair with alcohol began, um, I was I'll never forget the night. Um, it was the summer before eighth grade. Uh, I I believe I was twelve years old, and I was out with a group of my friends and I were just hanging out in the front yard of one of their homes, and his brother came out and. So I'm heading to the car and said, you know, what are you, where, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm on the way to the liquor store. And someone said, well, would you get some beer for us? And we gave him some money and he came back with three six packs of or beer. There were six of us boys. So that meant three beers each. And I'll never forget it. That, that first night I, uh, you know, opened that first can of beer and struggle to even get the first sip down, let alone the whole can. Um, but number one, I, I wanted to be one of the guys and I wanted to feel like I belong. Um, and then by the end of that third beer, it, it was transformational for me. Um, when I look back at it in that early stage of my you know, uh, adolescence, I guess, um, I really felt a lot of anxiety and um, lack of self worth. Uh, I, you know, I, and I have no idea really where that came from because, um, you know, I was raised by two incredibly wonderful, loving, supportive parents. Um, you know, our our family life was like something out of a Nor Norm Norman Rock Rockwell painting. But for whatever reason, I had a just an incredible amount of self doubt and feeling less than. Um, I was a really good student. I was a really good athlete. Um, but deep inside, I always felt like I was never good enough. So on that you know, warm summer night, when I finished that third beer, all of those anxieties and fears and feelings of less being less than all just drifted away. And suddenly I was smart and I was charming and I was good looking and confident. I was funny. And I, I loved the way it made, made me feel. Um, but then I also remember waking up the next morning with my very first hangover. And I think most people, you know, when that happens, they swear off by alcohol, say, I'm never doing that again. I was the opposite. I was thinking, when do I get to do that again? That was awesome. So I was off to the race. Um, I began drinking alcohol um, every weekend, starting at that age. And then once I entered high school, that weekend warrior drinking continued, but also started progressing to 
uh, drinking during the day sometimes after school. Um, I went to an all boys Catholic high school in Chicago, Brother Rice. And um, in the, you know, where I lived, we'd, we'd get out of school in the early afternoon and most, men, most of the families had dads and moms that worked. So we'd go to someone's house, break into the liquor cabinet or steal alcohol from, you know, the refrigerator out in the garage. And uh, I was off to the racing. Was there alcohol <laughs> in your family? There was. Now, thankfully, neither my mother nor my father were alcoholic. They barely drank at all. Uh, however, on my father's side of the family, uh, specifically my paternal grandmother, his mom, uh, was a raging alcoholic. I mean, you know, I, I still remember being very young child at, at our kitchen table early in the morning. We were having cereal and breakfast cereal, and I saw my grandmother reach into her, her purse and pull out a bottle of booze and start pouring it into her milk. It, you know, it was probably 730 in the morning. And um, yeah, so no, but th that said, um, on that part of the McGivney family tree, then not only was there, you know, a number of people who were alcoholics, but there was also folks with some serious mental health issues as well. So it, it definitely was part of my genetic coding, I guess you could say. Now, once you got into this, what was your daily routine of alcohol, you know, a few years later? Well, it, what really led to my ultimate, um, you know, institutionalization and the, the neurological event that happened, uh, my routine at that point, throughout my adulthood, I drank every day. Um, not to say I got drunk every day, because I did not. Uh, I was a highly functioning alcoholic. Uh, I had very, very good career. I, you know, we had nice things elaborate, you know, vacations, uh, expensive cars, you know, everything from the outside looking in looked like we had it all. But my alcoholism continued to progress throughout my adulthood. But my ritual that ultimately took me down began at the beginning of COVID lockdown. Really? Uh, it was the early first week of March, I want to say it was maybe March 8th, where at least down here in Florida, everything went into full-blown lockdown. The company I worked for uh, shut down. Uh, my, I was not allowed to go see clients. My income dropped to virtually zero. And unlike most people, because you know, I was not the only one who was afraid during COVID. Um, but rather than turn to my faith or to my family or to my friends, I just turned to vodka. And I started drinking every day. Uh, my ritual was at 7 a.m., my wife, Nicole, who's a kindergarten teacher, would leave the house. Uh, the, the private school she teaches at remained open during COVID. So I'd give her a little bit of a head start, and then I'd get in the car, drive to a local liquor store that opened up at 7 a.m. And at 7 a.m., I would walk in, and I would buy exactly three of the little mini shots, the airplane bottles of vodka and I would drink them in the parking lot and then make my way back home. Now there there was a calculated reason for why I did three shots because I, I actually owned my own personal breathalyzer <clears throat> and I knew that each shot would take me my blood alcohol level up to 0.025. So after three shots, I've done the math, I'm at 0.075 so I can legally mm -hmm. drink um, and that was important to me. So I also learned that my body would metabolize one shot per hour. So if I did three shots at 7 a.m., that meant at 9 a.m. I could do two more, at 11 a.m. two more, and at 1 p.m. two more, and at 3 p.m. two more, and come five o'clock, my beautiful wife Nicole is now home from school. And again, it's the heat of COVID. The grocery stores and liquor stores are about the only thing open. So we'd go to our local grocery store, you know, get food for the night, and I would make a detour in the liquor store, do three more shots of vodka, and bring home two bottles of wine. And I was doing that every single day for months and months. 
until the fateful night of December 30th, where my body gave out. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were married previously, had two children, and then you met Nicole in 2008. Nicole, what was it like living with Joe? Did, did you know he had this routine or you just accepted it or it was tough? I mean, I, I knew he was always a pretty big drinker and loved to drink and entertain. But I, you know, I, I just, I enjoyed our time so much together and we had a beautiful life together had so many great experiences together and I just thought of the man who he was and appreciated so many other attributes and could try to like focus on those, you know, um, rather than focusing on that problem. And I never was one really to be direct with my feelings as far as like, you know, gosh, this is so detrimental, not only physically to him, but like it's impacting us and our marriage. It's really starting to affect our relationship. And I mean, just the ripple effects of it all, essentially, not only he and I, but his children. I mean, it just, um, you know, and I, so I would say things, little things along the way, like subtly, but not be very strong or be all that forthcoming about it which in hindsight, you know, I, I probably should have been more assertive, but I really didn't um, speak up too much about it. And I just kind of brushed it under the rug and just kept doing life with him. And, but I would just internalize a lot of it, you know, till it got to a point where I would just blow up and then like, it would all come out and then it would be no good. <laughs> just, just, I would kind of unleash everything and, and I, and many times I would have a lot of anxiety, you know, just the day to day because of observing like what he was doing. And when he would start drinking, he would change. His whole demeanor would change. Things he, unpleasant things he would say to me. Never anything physical, fortunately, but like it just, I don't, it, it, it was like he turned into a different man. Right. You know, and I, wasn't used to like when he was sober I mean he was just so present and emotionally available and very affectionate and supportive and very sincere and then when he started drinking it was just I don't know he just turned into a different person and was me downright me a lot of the time and it was just so hurtful and he had no idea many times when I would say in the morning you know um this is what happened this is what you did and this is what you said and he had no recollection yeah. You know? yeah it was very um hurtful to me uh and i just didn't really know how to kind of navigate you know at times um yeah i just i swept a lot of it under the rug that i ignored right yeah. Joe, the first step of AA talks about admitting you have a problem and uh, that you can't handle it. Uh, was it only until you hit your psychotic episode uh, that you accepted that or understood that? Or was there any point before that you knew you had a problem, but you just weren't quite ready to take the step? You know, I started to actually internally realized that I had a problem um, a few years before I went down for the count. I used to travel frequently um, to Tampa as an example, and I would be there four or five nights out of each month, and part of my job was to entertain clients at night. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'd have a full day of meetings, you know, have a great day, um, you know, take a group over to Capitol Grill, uh, have a fantastic dinner. And, you know, I would drink very moderately. You might have one or two glasses of wine while I was with my clients. And then dinner would end, they'd go home, and I'd jump in the cab to head back to the hotel. And at that moment, I would be so filled with 
expectation for the next day. I would say, okay, tonight, it was a great day today. Everyone had a great time at dinner. My meetings were great. I'm going to go back to the hotel. I'm going to go straight to my room. I'm going to do some reading, watch some TV. I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow morning. Then I'm going to eat a healthy breakfast. And I'm going to go out and conquer the world again. And I knew I had a problem at that point because if you would, on that cab ride over to the hotel, if you had strapped a lie detector on me and said, Joe, are you going to have another drink tonight? I would have said no, and I would have passed the lie detector. But the minute I'd walked into that hotel lobby, saw the lobby bar right there, I would, would start all over again. It would be, okay, I'm going to have one more before I go to bed. And it would the evening would end up, you know, with the bar literally closing and them kicking me out and saying, you have to go to the <laughs> So it was, that's when I realized I had a problem, but I was not ready to yet take accountability. And um, someone recently shared a, a little scripture about that I think does an incredible job of describing what addiction feels like when you're in that place where you just cannot stop. In spite of everything you want, you cannot stop. In St. Paul of the Romans, chapter 7, St. Paul says, I am carnal, sold into slavery by sin. What I do, I do not understand. For I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. For I know that good does not dwell in me, that is in my flesh. The willing is ready at hand, but doing the good is not. For I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not. That's the mind of addiction. So, so it does. Well, doesn't it? Sure does. When did you feel you hit your bottom? Well, my bottom occurred after my <laughs> neurological episode. Um, Walk us so through I'm, that, Joe, please. Sure. Um, so... I'm drinking throughout COVID, starting in early March, and then the fateful night of December 30th, Nicole and I had decided to go out to dinner to get a head start on the uh, New Year's Eve rush. You know, we wanted to, we didn't want to be out on New Year's Eve. Now, I, what I'm going to share now, I have zero memory of. Um, everything I'm going to share now is what Nicole has told me and what I've read in medical records. So that night we went to dinner, we came home, Nicole <clears throat> and I had watched TV for a while. She went upstairs, went to sleep. I stayed downstairs drinking and watching TV. And then around 11 o'clock that night, my body completely gave out and collapsed. Um, thankfully, I had my phone in my hand when I found myself on the floor. I called Nicole, thankfully her, her ringer was on. She hadn't put her phone on silent. And I think I just said to her, Nicole, please come help me, something's wrong. And she rushed me, she found me on the floor, unable to even pick myself up. I was speaking kind of in gibberish. I wasn't making any sense. And I think she figured I was probably having a stroke. And she, you know, remember it's also COVID. So she gets me to a nearby hospital. They meet meet her outside the emergency room doors with a wheelchair. And that was the last time she laid eyes on me for weeks. So anyway, they put me in the, the first hospital. It's likely we learned that I, if Nicole had not woken up that night and gotten me to that hospital, I probably would have died on my floor that evening. So they get me to the hospital. They start detoxing me from alcohol. Um, it was touch and go a few times. They, they, they put me in the ICU. Um, but after about two weeks there, they had stabilized. Me. But, and I was, you know, medically detoxed from my alcoholism. However, cognitively, I was getting worse. And uh, over the next nine weeks, I would end up in a number of institutions, including three hospitals. And ultimately was diagnosed with Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. But I also had advanced, they, it, at my last stop was a locked psych ward. Um, I had been uh, 
committed to it. I was Baker active as it's known in Florida. And they said, they told Nicole, look, he, he's got full blown course called psychosis. And we're so bad, sad to tell you this, but he, there, no one ever comes back from that place. You will be that, you will be that way for the rest of his life. And you need to figure out what his permanent home is going to be because he can't stay here. So grace of God, Nicole found a treatment facility that agreed to basically babysit me for 30 days while she found my forever home. Um, so on March the 5th of 2021, I was discharged from the psych ward, transported to this treatment facility. And from what we can tell, they basically just put me to bed that night. And I woke up the following morning and now my memories are back. I was completely healed, completely healed. I woke up in this strange room. There was a dresser, a nightstand, a window and a bed. And I wandered out into the hallway and grabbed the first guy I saw was who happened to be a staff member. And I said, where am I? And why am I here? And over the next few days, that all became pretty clear why I was there. But, but at that point, I still was not ready to even hold myself accountable that I had a problem. So the first week and a half I, that I'm in this treatment facility, all I'm thinking is, I'm, how do I get out of here as fast as possible? Because I know Nicole can't be real happy about all this. And I know I'm going to lose her if I can't get out of here as fast as I can and you know, try to beg her to stay with me and give me another chance. So we had a scheduled phone call. Again, it's COVID. She can't come see me. I'm in my therapist's office, Nicole's on speakerphone, and Nicole says to me, Joe, you know, I'm so happy you're well. You have no idea what you really have been through over these last weeks, do you? And I, even though I had been told it, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And then I hear her start crying, and she says, Joe, I'm so happy you're doing well. When you get out, talk to your relatives, talk to your Aunt Jerry. My Aunt Jerry's the nurse, by the way, who's quarterbacking everything for us. She said, Joe, when you get out, I will, I, I'm gone. I've already packed everything up, I've spoken to lawyers. I'm asking you to just please leave me alone. And essentially she hung up. And in that moment was when I was finally willing to accept that I was an alcoholic and I needed help. Nicole, that had to have been very difficult. Uh time for you, but in retrospect, maybe that was what he needed, you think? I, I think so. I, th I think it was. I just, it had been so many years. I mean, in all different like instances and occurrences where um, alcohol impacted, you know, um, our experiences together in marriage. And it just, it, it like became just so much and too much. And it was just um, such a terrifying experience for me, such a dark place for me. For essentially those three months that he was, you know, going from institution to institution, and I was just completely devastated. It was so tragic. He was such an incredible man, an incredible guy with so many wonderful, beautiful gifts. He did this to himself. How could he be so destructive? I just, I never really understood it and i just you know i'm like he's so smart so many capabilities and so much potential yet he has this component you know this, this problem that has affected him and what it has done and essentially destroyed everything you know because of alcohol all because of alcohol and yeah it was just a really really tragic tough time for me and I had just had enough, to be honest. And I thought, you know what? It's probably, you know, God's way of saying that Paul you need to take another path. You know, you've been with him for as long as you have. And perhaps at this point now, you know, you've dealt with a lot over the years. Yeah. Uh, um it's so it's time, girl, to take a different path. 
go to that's what I did just temporarily. Joe, yeah, you, I Joe, you had mentioned earlier about you know low self-esteem and alcohol it reminded me of the movie the mask when the mask comes on he's a different person he's just mr entertainer type um but you you never in your faith walk had joined the knights of columbus and i got to thinking about that before the interview that it was probably your lack of self-esteem or maybe some feeling that you didn't belong or this guy was a holy guy and look what he did. And I'm, you know, hitting the booze so much. Did that, am I way off on that or did that? Not happen? too far off, but my, my faith life, <clears throat> you know, even though cradle Catholic raised around the church, tethered to the church, all boys Catholic high school. Um, my connection to my faith and to, to God never really happened for me. Um, I think in hindsight, it was maybe just, because I was innately a very selfish person. And, you know, once I no longer had to go to the church, I stopped going. So when I went off to college, um, I just, you know, the selfish me that I was didn't see what was in it for me to get up and go to Mass on a Sunday. I didn't see what was in it for me even other than baptizing my children. I did nothing to form their faith for them. Um, it, again, it, I, I was just this incredibly selfish, selfish, selfish human being. So my journey to faith, now I, I was aware of our connection to Father McGinley. Um, I became really aware of it when the book Parish Priest was written 20 some odd years ago. I remember my father calling me and saying, hey, get to the bookstore. Our relative Father Michael, there's a book about him. Um, but it just wasn't important. And the reason I ended up joining the Knights is as I was in recovery, um, number one, I had found my way back to the church. Uh, I was laser focused on the third step, which was made the decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of God. Everything I heard from every A meeting I started going to, made it crystal clear that the key to not only being recover in recovery, but the, the secret to having a life filled with joy, peace, and happiness was figuring out how to surrender everything to God. So that became everything. Um, so the, the connect part of, you know, working through the 12 steps, which I did thoroughly with a sponsor, is serving others. And it finally dawned on me, hey, what a great way to serve others is join the Knights of Columbus. After all, I'm related to Father McGiffey. <clears throat> and then I had learned, um, you know, at that point, I said, I better learn more about this guy. So I got online and I learned he was now blessed Michael McGiffey. I learned that he had been beatified two months before I was hospitalized on December 30th. Uh, and I learned that he there was needed one more miracle to become Saint Michael. So I joined the Knights, and the weekend after I joined the Knights, I called my aunt Jerry. I mentioned her a little bit ago. She's a nurse, devout Catholic woman. She was translating all the physicians what they had to say and relay relaying it to my family, especially the whole. And I said to Aunt Jerry that morning on a phone call. I said, to Aunt Jerry. Um, I joined the Knights of Columbus this week, and I was expecting her to be really happy. Instead, she starts sobbing. She's like, I, why do I keep making women sob? Anyway, she, <laughs> she says, Joey, when you when you were sick, I've never told you this, but I, I was praying to anyone who would listen. I was praying to Jesus. I was praying to Mary. I was praying to God. She said, but I was fervently praying to Father Michael. She said, I'm looking at his picture. And to me, it was as if all these dots connected. Um, I, by that point, I knew what had happened to me it was a, a miracle with no medical explanation. I knew it was indeed a, the grace of God and the hand of God that had pulled me out of that place I was in. But I always wondered why. Why did God choose me? 
because, you know, I was a sinner, I was selfish, I had turned my back on my faith. And maybe it was Father Michael's intercession that led to my that miraculous healing. So over time, Knights of Columbus got wind of my story. Um, they've written articles now. They produce some YouTube videos that you can find on the Knights of Columbus YouTube channel. Um, and so we all we know that there is another miracle that rests at the Vatican today. We pray that that will be the one that makes Blessed Michael Saint Michael. But in the event uh, it doesn't, there's not only mine, but there are a number of other mir Father, we give me attributed miracles that have the Knights have already started, you know, at least not investigating, but documenting. Yeah. So, and the other thing too, and it's part of why we wrote the book, is since his beatification, it appears that Blessed Michael has been a really powerful intercessor. There has been many, many reports of, you know, deep favors, yeah. including healing. That have been attributed to blessing. Um, one thing a lot of people don't see, but I believe it's there, is in the twelve steps. There's there's kind of a Catholic uh, spirituality, Ignatian spirituality, and um, one of my earlier shows, probably well over a year ago, was with the head of the order of uh, uh, Sister Ignatia. Uh, the angel of the alcoholic the angel of AA yes yeah. and uh, incredible story uh, I'd encourage viewers to go back and watch that because it gives you a real good history of Dr. Bob working he was an alcoholic a surgeon and got kicked off of hospital staffs and she befriended him and she became administrator of the hospital and was bringing in all these alcoholics because people thought back then it was some moral weakness and uh, they would Cops had let him sleep it off on the in jails, but she took him into the hospital right next to the chapel, and the spiritual conversion began. Uh, and it's really, and you look at the fifth step, admitted to God and to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. That to me is the sacrament of confession, and uh, there's such a tie-in with the faith, I think, and the spiritual growth uh, in, in AA. Um, so you're you're still involved in AA? You yes, I am. Um, and, and not only you know I still go to meetings, um, but I'm a, I frequently speak at AA meetings in different institutions. Um, for example, every other week I go into the Palm Beach County Jail and deliver AA meetings to those the inmates to the men. Um, I also go frequently in the treatment facilities, including the one I spent my 30 days in, and the one where my miraculous healing actually occurred. Um, so that's part of my giving back. And it's, you know, certainly keeps me tethered to AA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nicole, uh, how is your life now compared to what it was before this psychotic episode? Oh my goodness. Things are so much better. I can finally say it took a while. A number of years, actually. But I now have the marriage I've always, always ever needed. I can exhale and be at peace. I had so much anxiety and fear and worry for a number of years. But ever since this all happened and we hit rock bottom, essentially, and had this transformation, and I had some self-care, I took time for myself separate from him, away from him. And I, I did some, some work on myself too. Just we've grown so much, and I, you know, in such a beautiful way. Um, and we've got God now too, which we didn't have that component before. I was always very spiritual, you know, um, but he, like you said, he never really um, made faith a part of his life. And so um, we didn't have that aspect or component for a number of years up until most recently. And that has helped us tremendously. And we're very, um, you know, religious, following through with our prayers. And anytime either one of us feels um, just kind of out of sorts, we step away from one another and we go into the bedroom and 
we close the door and we have some just time alone to pray. Uh, and, you know, we're um, very grateful people nowadays with making our list of gratitude and we acknowledge one another and we're always um, just very thoughtful and uh, very present with one another now. We go to church every Sunday together. And, um, I actually, last Easter, I was baptized Catholic. So I'd never, both my parents raised, you know, were raised Catholic, but they never did anything as far as like exposing us to any sort of faith um, while growing up. So it wasn't until most recently that I decided to become a Catholic just because of how I was witnessing what essentially the religion and specifically, you know, the Catholic faith had done for him. And um, we started going to our parish and I just, I loved everything about, um, you know, the ceremony, the homilies, the music, the people there, just such a warm, inviting, loving experience. And I just wanted to know more and wanted to be fully immersed. And I had said to him one day after mass, I'm like, this is it, you know, I just, I, this is something I want to do. I, I never had any sort of like faith identification or belonged something, you know, faith wise, but this is where I want to be. This feels like home to me. So I want to be baptized. And that's what I followed through with. And he stood by my side the entire experience. He did all the classes with me, the coursework RCIA. with me, the RCIA, and he was my sponsor. And then, you know, this time, um, so Easter, last Easter is when I um, did, you know, the whole baptism and um, confirmation. So it's just been wonderful. That's been a big part of our life, and it's helped us tremendously. And that, that's, that's the beauty. You know, I had so many thoughts flooding my mind while you two were speaking. And in, in my own life, I um, yeah. think that I my biggest learning experiences came from my biggest mistakes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and yet we want to protect our children. And, you know, sometimes you just yeah. got to say, God, they got their own walk. And, uh, uh, yeah. you know, it's just, but this is such a story of God's divine mercy. Yeah. And the quote out of the diary of St. Faustina, the greater the sinner, the greater the right to my mercy. So we think we're not good enough. We think we're too unholy. But he says, no, come on up. You go to the front of the line. Yeah. Joe, any closing thoughts here before we wrap today's show up? No, I guess the um, couple of quick ones. The, the, the Number one, um, again, reiterating that Father Michael has proven to be a very powerful intercessor. Pray to him. Pray for his intercession. Um, there are mir miracles happen. Father, you know, as we call them, we know they're God's miracles, but Father McGivney's been pretty active. Um, and then for anyone who is, you know, struggling with addiction or alcoholism, know that there is a better way. There is a, there is a path out of it. Um, I, I just encourage you, you know, reach out to someone, ask for help. Get to an AA meeting, find a sponsor. Um, it was the best advice I had ever been given was get to AA and find a sponsor. And over just a period of months, the way my life transformed, and that's available to anyone. That's yeah. Yeah. And it's all about God's mercy, forgiving not only everyone in our lives, but forgiving ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Forgiveness is a big part. Well, Joe and Carol, I want to thank you so much for joining me today on Mercy Unbound. People, I hope you enjoyed the show. Please subscribe and share. And uh, we'll, we'll hope to see you all next time on Mercy Unbound. God bless. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R. And on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.